So what was happening prior to this meeting where uh, Martha was providing food for uh, Jesus and Mary came along with the perfume? What's some of the things that happened? Towards now, we're in Lent, there's a bit of a clue there. Towards Easter, what's some of the things that happened? They raised Lazarus from the dead and Jesus said a whole, some stuff about resurrection in that. And prior to that, he had said that he was heading towards Jerusalem and that he would be, he would die there, didn't he? He made the prediction and the disciples, they didn't want to hear that. And I was thinking, you know, that's a pretty common reaction, isn't it? When you hear something that you really don't, like or don't want to be true you don't want to listen to it and often we've got to let that filter in a little bit before we can actually hear it uh, and respond to it so we're very much like the disciples in that sense of not wanting to hear news we tend to have our hope fixed on what we think is going to happen now at Cheltenham, we've had some experience of waiting and patience. But I think that isn't that our journey through life? I can remember as a teenager, I was waiting until I got old enough to drive. And probably now, I see people are getting older that are hoping they'll still be able to drive for a bit longer. The things that we hope for and struggle when we can't do them, it's part of our human adjustment to what's happening. So the disciples didn't want Jesus to go to Jerusalem. To, they didn't want him to go. Ma, Mary saw something different. She perceived something that God was doing for this. She was listening for something different. And I think there's a message there for us of whatever we're experiencing, particularly if it's something that uh, is really hard for us to grasp, hard for us to accept, to sit with that and then to, ref to allow God to help us to see what is the new thing that God is doing and to perceive where things are moving. Because otherwise we can miss what God, miss the very thing that God is doing, the new thing, by trying to hold on to what God has done in the past. Mary's active devotion was showing that she was willing to look beyond and support minister to Jesus and the word there where about serving is about is also used when it's about men interestingly enough it's used the term ministry so she was ministering to Jesus the one who had come to serve was being ministered to maybe we don't allow people to minister to us enough because we're too quick to sort of say no 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 don't do something special for me that's that's okay I rather than accepting graciously what someone has offered in their ministry to us. So the Isaiah reading, letting go of the past and being open to what God is about to do. Prior to that section, because they're in exile, remember, and they're uh, remembering what happened with coming out of uh, the Exodus, coming out of Egypt, and what, what God had done to set them free. Their conception of what God was going to do was maybe to do a similar thing to what had happened in the exile. So could it be that God was saying, I'm going to do something, I'm going to help you in this situation, but the way I do it will be different to what I've done before. And following on from that prophecy, what, Jesus, what God did through Jesus' life, death, ministry and resurrection, is something different to what had happened before. But our conceptions of what we think God is doing sometimes makes it hard for us to recognise when God's at work. It's very easy to, to focus on what we've lost, what we think we've lost, and to think if only we could get back to be able to do that, things would be okay and it'd be back to normal. 
And of course, we know that uh, normal is not something now that is as easy to obtain as what it was in so many different ways. So what's the role of the church in these times? Now, in the email, David, uh, the notice sheet David sent out about Acts 2. And uh, if you get a chance to read that, it's really helpful um, to see what, uh, what is written there about Acts 2 and the challenges the church faces. And even by saying it's challenges rather than problems is a, is a matter of saying, what is God saying to us at this time? And the one that struck me uh, in the email and looking at that this week was, they describe one of our challenges, a lack of relevance to the community, especially to younger generations. Remember the rail enthusiasts? What are they preserving? Hmm? The past. The memory and experience of trains is something that really excites them. And it's it's really good to look at the past, to see how things were and to remember the past and particularly with the grandkids to go along and enjoy that or with someone who's really passionate about it. There's a danger for us in the church of how do we, how do we, the challenge is how do we connect with people today to actually help them to connect with God? Because in the end, what we're trying to do is get them to connect with God. In the past, we found that particular forms of the way that we've lived together and worked has meant that people come in. In the church that I grew up in, people, you either belong to the footy club or the church, basically. In town, there weren't too many other, well, in Grovedale, there weren't many other places except for the pub. Uh, and uh, the post office and the lolly store. I remember the lolly store very fondly. Bailey's were the people that ran that. And it was almost like going into somewhere really exciting back in those days. But people, all you had to do was open the church and people came in. So people were willing to come into our space and learn from us what it is to connect with God. But today, there's not that same willingness for gener younger generation to come into church. How do we convey to them what faith, our faith is about? Because in the past, we've, been, we've talked about our church programs, our worship, the things that we do in our building. And that's been the things that uh, we put a lot of passion and energy into. People have come in and we've been... That's the way a lot of people have come to faith through connecting with those experiences. So what do we do today to connect and share people with their faith? The second challenge, or third challenge, the second one is a loss of trust in the church and we know there's a whole lot of things and even recently uh, things with, at Hillsong have uh, probably not helped that. The third one is the inability to communicate the gospel, to share the faith, to articulate the ethos and values of the church. In the book that I was reading on uh, the early church, one of the things it was saying was that before you could uh, enter the church, you had to be baptised. I think I said that a couple of weeks ago. But there was a, at least a 12-month process before you were ready to be baptised. And you also had to get to a point where you were reflecting the values, the life of Jesus before you were, went into the church. So the community of the church was, was protected by making sure the people in it knew what, the, what was important. Somewhere along the line, we reduced confirmation down to Six weeks? Who did six weeks? We had a six-week program after Billy Graham crusade. 
then it got that way, it was really hard to get kids to come along for that length of time with their studies. And the whole emphasis on confirmation, we just don't have the, the children going through in the way that we used to. Sunday school. Sunday school teachers used to have to know how to communicate the faith, do their, to do that ministry of teaching the, the children. Back in the days when we used to have Lenten studies and Advent studies more often, we had the opportunities to talk about our faith and to do things. Have we missed some of, with, have we missed some of those opportunities to actually learn how to communicate? But then the faith we were communicating at that time was probably the faith to people who were insiders. What we need to do today is to be able to communicate the faith to people that are outside, people who don't have the same beliefs as us, but people who believe that God in some way is at work out in the world. And for us to say that God's at work here, come along and see, is not necessarily going to be something that they're interested in. But if we can help connect with them of, What's your experience of God? This has been mine and share experience and learn together. Then as the journey along the road, as Jesus did with people, people come to learn and to experience the presence of God. Because that's what we need to be doing. It's connecting with our neighbours in a way that we can share the faith that we believe in. We can live that out. And that's what attracted people to the early church, the living out of the faith in a community where it was hard going. There were threats because people who believe, there was persecution for people in the church. There was uh, plagues that were happening and the church people were reaching out and providing food for people and caring for people who were going through difficult times. We found that a lot harder to do in the last two years. But maybe we need to look at how we might do that in different ways. What's the new thing? What is it that God's revealing to us? What's the goal that we're doing? We need to be working to keep our worship and our, our journey, our growth, our spiritual life together strong. That's it is a key, but we also need to be working out how each of us, when we go out and meet with people, can share our faith and help people recognise the presence of God in their lives. The Philippians reading, I didn't have Nan read that today, but I wanted to finish with the Philippians reading, particularly the end of it, because Paul goes through and said, I, I did everything that was expected of me, it was all important and I became the sort of person that was um, someone highly valued in the life of the church at the time. Then he writes, not that I've already attained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but this one thing I do, Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us then who are mature be of the same mind. And if you think differently about anything, this too God will reveal to you. Only let us hold fast to what we have attained. We need to hold fast to what we have obtained but learn how to apply it in a different context. And I think that's the pressing goal. That's the one I'm passionate about, one of the things I'm passionate about for the future. And I'm looking forward to what God might show us and what we might learn along the way and the new things that God will reveal to us.